and I got well, welcome. Ready. <laughs> yeah, well, welcome, welcome everybody. I'm super excited that we get to spend the next hour with Julio, who has just a wealth of knowledge. He's He's been in the beauty industry since 1980. He's won multiple awards, not only with John Paul Mitchell Systems as a master stylist, but also the International Art of Fashion Group. He's an inspirational speaker for the beauty industry. He's a graduate of Harvard Business School, earning his executive MBA. He's award-winning author of two books, Slap on the Back of the Head and Unwrapping Your Gift. He owns multiple beauty schools, salons, and spas. And what I love about him is his mission is to teach, help, and guide individuals to reach their true potential, no matter what obstacles they face. So welcome, Julio. How are you today? Fantastic. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. And, you know, I think one of the things that I just was, as I was reading your bio and just thinking over the weekend, one of the things I wanted to ask you is what makes you feel, you know, inspired or your best self? Because in the in the 20 plus year, I mean, all these years that you've been in the industry, you still remain positive, inspirational, out in front of people. So what really inspires and motivates you? Um, you know, it, it's that core belief that, you know, when I, when I was younger, not a lot of people wanted to reach out and help me uh, until I really changed my way of thinking and sought out people who were willing to be mentors and they're out there. There's some that tell you they would be, but they're not. But there are many people who want to share just like I do. And, and my belief has been what is given to me is a gift. And now it's my turn to give that gift to someone else. So what keeps me inspired and motivated and excited is knowing that I can give that to someone who believes they can't and inspire them with the ability that they can. I love that. So as you, as you think of, you know, what are the best resources that have helped you along the way? I know that you mentioned, you know, mentors. And so talk a little bit about how important mentors are and, you know, who are some of yours and how have they, how have they helped you guide you through the, through the journey that you've had? Because a lot of people that are listening to us today um, maybe are just starting their salon owning journey or, or maybe they're halfway through and they're losing some inspiration. And what were those resources that, that helped you and pushed you and, and guided you? You know, mentors come in many forms and many different people. Uh, and I usually gravitate to the mentors who are uh, doing well, uh, that are successful. And what I mean by successful, not rich, but happy and excited about what they do. And that it could be anywhere from your child to a salon owner. Uh, to your your students or your staff. I mean, everybody mentors me uh, and teaches me along the way. So, I mean, besides our obvious mentors uh, that we have, such as Wynn and John Paul and Luke and, you know, Tina and, uh, you know, so many people out there. We, the list can go on forever. I feel like I'm at the Emmys giving a thank you to everybody and you wouldn't get them in on time because the music would start playing and kick you off stage. But, um, it, it's anybody willing to sit down and have a good, positive conversation, whether you agree or disagree, but give you food for thought to sit back and say, you know what, maybe at that time I did disagree, but after check, you know, checking this out and, and thinking about it, there is some sense to that. Let me tweak that to what my beliefs are, and maybe I can upgrade that. But mentors, you're my mentor. Um, anybody who has any kind of positive attitude, uh, positive talk, solution oriented, because um, we could talk about problems all day long, but a good mentor will talk about solutions all day long. They'll tell you the problem, but they'll give you solutions that will help and guide you to that next level. And then you do what you will with that information. I mean, just watching a child play is a great learning source of how free and how they believe they are that person. You know, I looked at my kids growing up when my kid was a cowboy, he wasn't Julio or he wasn't Stephanie, he was a cowboy. You had to address him as a cowboy or if he was a fireman, you had to dress him because they were in that moment. Now, to me, that's a great mentor. That was being in the moment. That was inspiring. Um, somebody, believe it or not, I am a very spiritual man, but someone gave me a Bible once. 
They must have thought I needed it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, just when I, when I opened the you know, book up and it went to Matthew, and like I said, I, I, I ended up reading the whole thing on Matthew, but it talked about how he fed his people. And to me, that was something that just resonated is, wait, my job is to feed people around me, hope that they eat well, meaning informational wise, maybe give them a little appetizer, but if they can leave full, I am fulfilled, you know? So like I said, wherever you turn, whatever you look at, there's a mentor somewhere if you're searching for them. Uh, meaning, how can I find the right mentor is the question, rather than why doesn't anybody help me? Why can't I find a mentor? Because you're not going to, because you're focused on why you can. But if you focus on how you can, you will. I love that. And so what was some of those conversations that, you know, what are some good food for thought that was given to you throughout, throughout your journey? Well, the first and foremost is not, Julio, forget about how great of a hairdresser you are. That's not the point. Now, technical skills, don't get me wrong, are extremely important. But are you nice? Are you honest? Are you humble? Do you have integrity? Um, do you serve the people? Which is really important. Do you sit and listen? Uh, do you repeat what you heard so that they feel that they've been heard? And once again, it goes all back to that is part of the experience part, because most people think they have to be technical savvy, which comes in helpful. Uh, but the greatest lesson was it's not 15% of that technical is going to get you where you need to go. But 85% of that is the experience your customer is having. And everyone you meet, and I mean everyone, is a customer or a potential customer. And to be humble, vulnerable, full of integrity, and I'm point, uh, you know, because if you ever meet some people that, you know, walk around and have to say, well, I'm the owner of the salon. Well, we know you're the owner of the salon. You, that's who hired us. You, you don't have to tell me every day, I'm the manager, I'm the director, you know, and it's like, well, we know you had that title a long time ago. That's not being humble. That's greediness for power. Because if you are a person of leadership, you don't have to tell people you are of leadership. You have to model that process. You have to walk the walk, talk the talk, and, 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 and be the example. And to me, that was what makes a great, great leader. And those things that I were, was taught was something I was instilled in my own culture growing up Italian, you know, uh, but it was more like give everybody as much food as you can. Uh, that was your way of being nice. So, uh, and be respectful. And, and, and even though I carried that un, unconsciously by people constantly reminding me, mentors, that that is the greatest gift you can give anyone. Um, even as I, I, I work with the local sheriff's department, that was one of my dreams in, uh, when I was a young man. And we're based around the same thing, is serving the community. There are clients how do we make our clients happy? How do we connect with them? How do we create relationships? How are we honest with them? Uh, what are we doing to help them uh, rather than going out, you know, chasing people down and trying to arrest them? It's how do we prevent the crime from happening by teaching and giving knowledge? So no matter what field you're in, it's all about those things that we just mentioned, honesty, integrity, humbleness, uh, you know, uh, I love it when people come up to me and they're like, I'm this, I'm great, I can do hair, you know, I mean, they're, and I'm like, I, I'm so happy you told me everything you're great at. Now, shut your mouth and show me, you know, model that process. Let me see, because sometimes the person who blabs everything they're great at is because they're not. But the person who is actually good at what they do and on purpose models and does that process and doesn't have to speak it they just do that's great so talk talk about you know that situation or or incident you know we all have it where we have that team member who's just not that humble person how do you go in and how do you coach them and what does that dialogue look like to maybe make them realize or or when do you realize that maybe they're just never going to be a team player and on that level of humble. When, 
when when is enough enough i guess you know uh, first first of all before i hire anybody there's three reasons i'll hire you one is attitude two is attitude three is go ahead tell me attitude you got the job uh, because we could teach you the rest and some people do show up with a great attitude but then they get the job and all of a sudden they feel it's their job now to be the resistor, to be the one that's going to fight you on everything in the dress code and the culture and the systems. And we'll usually take the first part to say, okay, maybe there's not an understanding. Maybe I didn't do a good enough job to explain what it means to be a team player or to be part of this culture and, and, and this group. Um, so I'll have a couple of coaching sessions with them and say, you know, I noticed this type of behavior, uh, how do you feel about that? And I'd let them talk and I'd say, well, what do you think we can do better to change? Because this is what I notice, and here's what needs to happen. What do you think we can do? See, I always want to put it on their lap because they're, they're the ones that, that create and support what they create. So when I get their answers, I repeat it to them. And it's funny when you repeat what somebody says, <laughs> They're like, no, that's not what I said. I'm like, well, tell me again. Um, and they'll tell me and I'll keep repeating it. And it's just, sometimes you learn that people are that way because of personal things that are going on in their lives or maybe an upbringing they have or some, some depression they're going through, especially in these unprecedented times. I mean, we've had a lot of those talks and it has nothing to do with not wanting to be a team player. It's, uh, in, in most cases, it's something that's going on personally in their lives. Um, but if we get that person that just, no matter how much you coach, we don't lose our temper. I don't lose my mind. I just say, well, I think this relationship isn't for us. Uh, I, I believe you have your own ways of doing things, your own uh, ideas. And it's probably a good idea that you start your own company or get into a, another salon that shares your ideas and values. But it, if you're going to be part of our team, here's our team values, uh, and this is what we need. If we can't get that, then we must, you know, shake hands and part ways. And sometimes, unfortunately, you have to do that. But you can't let it drag on forever. You know, I say, okay, strike one. Okay, strike two. I'm going to get a little stern here. So oh, there is no strike three. I mean, strike three, you're out, you know, and but I've exhausted every possible communication with you first to find out who you are, what is causing this challenge? Why, why, are, you, why are you being the way you're being? Because it could be something that um, maybe we could all work on this together. But it, if it's just that person and they're out there who just, you know, you say yes, they say no, you say white, they say black. It's just, you know, you, you can't go on with the insanity uh, like I say in a relationship, uh, you know, if, you, if you're dating a jerk and you keep dating the same jerk over and over again and nothing changes, that's insanity. Uh, you learn from that relationship and you, you might have to call it off as much as you may love that person, uh, but you have to understand what you want and what you want to be around uh, and not have to be around. I love that. You talked about um, values and you talked about your business values and you listed some earlier how important um, are your values obviously it's the core of what you do but when did you realize your values for your businesses you know I I, I unconsciously at first because that's the way I was just brought up to to just treat people great uh, I, you know I wasn't perfect by any means you know uh, but it was the constant uh, messages of people that I surrounded myself with that were good at what they've done. I mean, if you want to be great at a relationship, ask people in a great relationship what keeps it great. And what, look at the relationship. Look how they communicate. Of course they fight, but what do they do to solve that problem? Solve it together, work on it together, not go to bed mad. You know, so uh, when, when that kept getting instilled in my mind, uh, you tend, and, and you ask yourself that question, how uh, do I support my values? Um, you get the answers and you start studying people. Uh, I should have been a profiler. 
<laughs> you know, I always say, because I do study people. I study their behaviors. And I, then I reflect on my own and say, am I, am, am I that person uh, deep inside? So values to me are extremely important because the values will create your behavior. Uh, and if you model that behavior, uh, which means I'm not, you know, I don't have somebody, if I have to plunge a toilet, I'll plunge a toilet. And you know that when you do it, other people will do it. If I have to fold towels, they will fold towels. I don't have to even ask. As long as they see the leadership doing what is asked of them, they'll come over and ask you if they can help you. If they see you sweeping the floor, if they see you manually cleaning, instead of being that, well, I'm the boss, I don't do that, you do that. Well, no, that's not true. That's not a leader. A leader leads by example. And you'll notice that people uh, will, will follow. Uh, I went into a, salon, a school that we opened up on, excuse me, and the, the director kept saying, nobody will help. Nobody will fold towels. Nobody will clean the stations. Nobody will do this. And I said, watch. I picked up a towel, some spray, and I started wiping the bottom of the chairs, cleaning the chairs. They're like, hey, hey, you're the owner. You shouldn't be doing that. I said, no, because I am the owner. This is part of my job. And they're like, well, can I help? I'm like, yeah, you can help. Next thing you know, you got 10 of your biggest school resistors, you know, and your salon resistors all of a sudden cleaning the place. And it was funny because one future professional walked down and said, did we get new equipment? <laughs> you know, we're like, no, we cleaned it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and when, you, when, you, when you follow those values and those behaviors, you'll want to get the knowledge to support those values and behaviors. And knowledge is powerful, very powerful. And I think we learn a lot um, and gain a lot of knowledge from, from failures. So what are, what are some of the failures uh, that you've lived through and what have you learned through them? My God, I, you know, people are like, you must be perfect. You know, I'm like, no, by all means, I still create failures to this day. But failures is what makes us stronger, is what helps us grow. There's been many times I have fallen on my face throughout my life. Uh, you know, from anywhere from addiction, uh, because of insecurity, low self-esteem, uh, thinking that it, it would empower me, but it put me back on my face, getting back up, letting go of, of that. Uh, you know, even besides all the things, let's talk, talk about the salon. I did a bad haircut. The customer's been coming to me forever. She's gonna get married Saturday. This is a true story. And I cut her hair and all of a sudden I left a big hole on the side of that cut. Oh my, discovery. You know, failure, uh, her wedding's in a few days. What do I do? Well, I can't shut down at that moment. I have to think of the solution. So I learned how to make some hair weaves way before in Wefts, before they were even out because we were doing hair shows. And I made her a bunch and, and cleaned up. Now, I've never seen her as a client again, but it, it was enough to help for her wedding. Uh, but instead of getting angry, what you do at yourself is I call a friend. I got a lifeline and he was a cutting expert. And I said, what happened? I, I pulled it straight out. I cut it and it just collapsed. He said, well, everything concaved on you, right? He said, there was no hair to support that. It was a little bit finer. If you over directed it, what would have happened? I, was said, I said, well, I would have left more length, more volume. He says, what are you gonna do to your next haircut on somebody's hair like that, you know? So those are, are ways of learning. So may, I may have lost a client, but I gained a hundred more by just going back and checking where did I fail? How did I fail? What made me go into that failure? But how can I adjust it so it doesn't happen again? Um, I always tell people, you're always gonna face pain, but suffering is a choice. Hmm. So, you know, if you broke your leg, you're not gonna suffer the rest of your life, walk around with your bone hanging out your leg going, look what I did. You know, and it hurts. No, you're going to go get it fixed. You got a toothache. It's pain. You got to either live with it or fix it. What's the choice? Um, so failures, I can probably write a book a bigger than an encyclopedia. Uh, but, you know, I've been through so much. Uh, but I think that's what put me at where I am today is not I don't dwell on the failures. I don't forget them, but I learn from them. Uh, and, you know, what is failure? You know, 
some people see it as the end of the world. I see it as the beginning of something new. I love that. And you touched on something where you're very right that people get stuck in their head. They focus on their failures so much instead of the future. So what advice would you give to kind of get them out of that, that head space and, and move forward? You know, in, in the book, I, I talk about the yin and the yang, Sonny and Vinny. You know, one is the good guy, one's the bad guy. Those are your own thoughts. Uh, you have to choose what you listen to in your head. And it's hard to fight. It really is. And we all have those voices. Now, I'm not talking about voices. You know, if you do hear some real voices, please go see a doctor. But I'm talking about the voices in your, in your own head that, that you can choose to, to fight back on. And, and trust me, I argued with those voices in my head until mm -hmm. I won. Meaning, there are my voice that says, you know, you, you can't, you won't, you, you, you're a failure, you're, you know, because that's the voices that maybe your mother or your father or your uncle or a teacher or somebody has put there. And now you got to get this other voice that battles that voice and says, no, you are much better. You can always achieve anything, no matter where you come from, no matter what you did. So it's not going to happen overnight. It's a battle you're always going to do. Even in the morning when I wake up, I have a battle of should I get up and go to the gym or should I not go to the gym? What excuse am I going to use this morning? Uh, so, you know, those battles are fought even when I'm laying there. But then the thought of, of going to the gym wins because I remember when I was unhealthy, uh, I, I was a walking dead man, um, you know, and it was not to be skinny. It was to be healthy and, I, and in order to be with my family and to be the example to my family, to my kids, to my staff, to um, all those around me, I got to model the process. So if I'm telling you, you got to, you know, get healthy, not lose weight. Skinny is not, you know, that'll come as, you know, you work out, but that's not the goal. The goal is to be healthy and to get that blood flowing and to get that right mindset so you can think clearer. Um, so yeah, you, you know, I think we all battle our thoughts. Uh, and some people say, no, I never battle my thoughts. Well, you're battling it right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I, I hope I answered your question on that. Yeah, I, I love that. I think, you know, it goes back to just how powerful your thoughts are and how important it is on what you, what you choose to listen to. So as we look to, um, you know, we're in 2020. It's a very different uh, era for us all. Um, what are salon owners missing right now, in, in your opinion, being that you're in both worlds? You're in the school world, which we're going to talk about in a minute. I just saw some questions that popped up about the school world. Um, but what are salons missing right now, do you think? Well, I can't speak for all of them. Uh, I know in the, the world what was missing was the salon. <laughs> And, and, and in this pandemic, an unprecedented time, I think what good came out of that is people saw the need for a great salon. Uh, not even a great salon, just give me my barber back, give me my hairdresser back, give me my makeup artist back. We, we went from here to up here uh, and, and nobody was saying, where's my doctor? Where's my dentist? Where's my plastic surgeon? Where, where's my hairdresser? I mean, that's all they talk about and still do. But with salons, you know, what I, when people go out and they look for a job, they want to know, today, we don't interview them. They interview us. Believe it or not, you think you're interviewing them. You're not. They're interviewing you. And, and what they care more about today is, what are you doing to save the planet? Number one. You know, number two, what are you doing to educate me further? What, do you, what, what plans do you have? What is your culture? What is your systems? What is your plan? Because most salons don't have, they have a plan here, but not here on paper or in a book or in a binder. And they change the rules constantly every day. But did you ever take a moment to not think of what the future coming in needs or what your clients need? But did you ever take a moment to ask them what they would like? because or what they've experienced and what they would like to experience so 
in today's salons, once again, there are some that say, I am the ruler, here's how it goes. I get that, that is your salon, that is your system, this is, this is how your system goes in your culture. However, are we providing the right tools and are we giving them the tools and materials and, 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 and paperwork they need to understand their tasks and their expectations? Um, and that's missing is the communication. It's not get behind the chair and make me money. You know, get to know them, get to understand them, see where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are. Do a floor test with them, see, you know, okay, they're an okay cutter. Maybe we need some more technical skills. Mm, I noticed their verbiage is a little rough. Let's teach them because I had to learn how to speak properly in a salon all over again. Cause I was like, hey, how you doing? Am I doing, you, you know, uh, they were like, well, Julia, let's take that down a little bit to good morning. How are you, Mrs. Jones or Mr. Jones? Uh, I'm, I look forward to, you know, doing your hair services today. Please come with me. Uh, because I was, you know, I come from Italy. Then I, I, I grew up in New York. So, you know, I grew up in a little rough neighborhood where we had our own slang. Uh, you know, so what salons are, 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 some salons, not all are missing the excitement of teamwork relationships mm -hmm. with their team, conversations, uh, uh, caring, uh, but most importantly, training. You know, even if you think it's, because we, I've been doing it for so many years, it's common sense for me. It's built in within me to know that customer service experience is important. Uh, but maybe somebody new coming in they, they're great at cutting, but they don't understand the experience part of it. So having a good training system and an open communication helps a lot in salons. I think that will, will ultimately take them. And, and sitting with your staff, be humble enough to say, hey, how am I doing? As a salon owner, how am I doing for you? You, know, you don't have to accept it because there are some people who won't agree that you're doing well for them. Well, sometimes it's hard to hear, but sometimes it may be the truth. And I've done surveys with, uh, that are anonymous with, with the staff. This is how am I doing? And there were some things that opened my eyes, you know? Uh, and there were some things I didn't agree with, but they still opened my eyes, you know, because if the common thread is this, then it must be true. And even though it's hard to, to accept that, uh, I had to change, not give in, but change so that my team can help me achieve my goals. Because if I can help them achieve their goals, obviously in return, they're going to help me achieve mine. I love that. You talked about, you know, your surveys and receiving feedback. So how, um, how important as a leader is feedback and how do you pivot when the feedback is not what you want to hear? Well, first and foremost, Every day, you will never see me go straight to the office. Well, to drop off my stuff really quickly, the first thing I do is interact with everyone. Everyone, hello, good morning, how are you? Now, if you're a good people reader, you can see something's not happening, something's not wrong. And, then, and I'll say, hey, you're not your usual self today, but let's, let's go for a coffee, let's talk. And I'll say, is there anything I can help you with? And they'll sit there and they'll put their head down and I'm like, is it your job? You know, sometimes you got to pull a little bit. And they're like, well, no, the other day you came up to me and you said this. Now, I said it in my mind thinking it was innocently or maybe a little joke because they joke with me. But I, have, I forgot that when I respond, they take it as serious, not a little joke. Yeah. Or if I say something, it could be devastating to them. You know, even if it's, you know, why don't you wrap that a little bit tighter or why don't you, you know, uh, it's a simple little thing. And they're like, the way you approached it just made me feel like I'm not good at what I do. And then I have to stop and, and say, you know what, my apologies, that was not my intention. My intention always to make sure that you get the best. My intention was to share knowledge with you. So if I came across the wrong way, I apologize. What works for you when I need to come and coach or help or give you some advice? What's a good way that I can approach you? How, how can I, because everybody has a, some people like to be yelled at. 
that, they're like, no, yell at me. I need that. You know, some people are very tender and they're like, I need you to just be softer or I need to, you, you to speak to me in private. You know, get to know your people. It's like the MIs that we use. Once we understand how they learn and we can communicate with them that way and we understand how they like to be communicated, they'll be more open to you. And the fact that you stopped just to ask them, what can I do better to help you so that I can make you want to come here and enjoy coming here. Um, they're like, wow, you are a real, and I get this all the time, you're a real person. You're, you're not like an owner, but I know you're the owner. You're like a caring person. And I'm like, well, shouldn't we all be? You know, so, uh, and, and like I said, sometimes it hurts to hear, oh God, I've been acting that way. Mm, so I better reflect back a little bit and understand. And maybe the way I was acting was proper but to that person who is still a little bit low self-esteem or, or not enough confidence maybe i should have approached that a little bit differently so how do i get to know my staff better let's go for a cup of coffee let me understand you uh you're not just my employee you're my partner you're my teammate we're in this together nobody can do it alone uh you're trying to up your income in the salon you can't do it alone uh, you can only do so much. Uh, you're trying to get your teams to, to fulfill their dreams and up their incomes. And in return, it'll help yours. Even if it's having to sit there and listen to something you don't want to. <laughs> we've, all, we've all been there for sure. Yeah. Uh, I do see some questions in the chat, but I just wanted to touch on something that, you know, we kind of ask our, our guests that come on. And, you know, why do you, why do you think you know, our graduates, the young professionals entering the industry, you know, they have a very short span. Some of them are super successful and go on. And unfortunately, there's a lot of them that, that choose a different career. What is it do you think that we can do in, as the salon owners, the salon managers, and in the schools to really um, keep them inspired and, and staying in this industry? It all goes back to education information uh letting them know because you know i've had to uninvite some guest speakers who come in with false hopes uh lies you know you're gonna make a hundred thousand your first year no not everybody you've got to be patient it takes time uh to build a clientele whether you're a doctor a lawyer an engineer a new store owner a salon owner or a stylist it takes patience and it takes time and most people give up because they want it to happen tomorrow. It's like beauty school. You know, when we first started beauty school, the dreams were all here and the excitement and the imagination of how busy and how much money you're gonna make. And then they get six months into the program and they're like, hey, they look at it as a prison sentence. You know, I got six <laughs> months left, you know? Uh, because in between that vision to the point of where you wanna go, there's work. And, and that's the, the hard part. And some people, uh, you know, still have to learn and we have to focus on how to teach them to be more open to meeting people. And I tell them, you have the greatest line in the world. I am a hairdresser. You know, when you say that, people surrender, knock down all walls and they're like, oh, don't look at my hair. Oh, no, you know, my last haircut, which opens the opportunities. Even if you have a great, if I looked at you, Sean, I would say, my God, you know, if I, I met you and say, I love your hair. I love your color. I would love to work on your hair. I love working on people who love the, the style that you have and wear the styles that you have. Here's my card. Now, if I did that to 100 people a day and picked up one, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. because that one I can give the best experience to ever and they will tell 10 other people they got the worst experience ever they're going to tell 100 people <laughs> you know uh you know I mean the review you know now they could just go on review and, and and I don't even watch the reviews I have to ask people because some people might be bitter about something that didn't even exist or happen but our our our, our futures that are professionals that are going out there are getting discouraged because they do go to salons that offer them the world but never follow through. Not all salons. I will say there are some phenomenal salons out there and I've seen some of our future professionals never leave them because they've been supported, they've been given the education, they've been given the, 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 the 
the ability to fulfill the dreams that the salon owner or the, the HR person, whoever hired them, promised them. Mm -hmm. But then there are people who say, I'm going to promise you this, and they never give them any lessons, any classes, or they just make them fold towels all day, or they make them just run and get coffee all day. That's not their job. You know, sometimes I'll say, hey, I'll buy if you fly, you know, uh, but I have to remember too that I'm going to take you through a journey of what I promised you. I'm going to teach you how to give that great shampoo because even when they leave school, don't think that they're going to come out like Edward Scissorhand. Uh, even after 40 years of doing hair, I'm still learning. You never stop learning. Once you think you know it all, hang it up mm -hmm. because that's when you get cocky. And our kids today, and I say kids, some of them are 30, 40, 50 years old coming out of beauty school, 70. Um, you still, they're looking for that mentorship, that confidence, that somebody believes in them and will lead them. Uh, we're all looking for the person to lead us to the Holy Land, if, if, you, if, if I may. Uh, I'm not trying to be religious or push religion, but it's just a metaphor for saying, you know, you promised me this, and yet that's all I'm doing is picking up your laundry or washing your car, you know, or just watching you. I can go home and watch YouTube and watch a haircut. You know, how are you involving me? And as for future professionals, when you get out there, you know where your heart belongs when you get to a salon. You know the feeling that you get. It's like when you meet your first love. You get that feeling. You know you belong there. So if you're not getting what is promised, first, be professional and speak to the owner or speak to the manager. Stay always professional. Don't speak to the other employees because they're not the ones that can make the change. It's the person who owns that salon that may be unaware that their artistic director is not giving what has been promised. So take it to the owner or to the artistic director and say, hey, this is what you promised and, and I feel like I'm just not getting any of that. And you also have to have those meetings to say, listen guys, I know you're at this point weekly and say, but look at this week, you increased by one or two clients. You're getting further, hang in there. Let's make a goal for two more new clients. And if you get more than that, that's great because it takes about two to three years before you really start feeling your edge mm -hmm. uh, in any business. But what people do is they give up so fast because they wanted it yesterday. They take an office job they hate. They start another career they hate. Uh, but the ones who stick with it, and practice and, and keep looking for the place they need to be and keep looking for those clients. Wow, the things I've seen some of these future professionals achieve. I mean, I, I know one future professional has so many millions of people on her Instagram. I'm like, are you kidding me? You just got out a year ago uh, because they post all their work. They post positive things. They post uh, beauty tips. Um, they, they, they found the right niche. You know, and um, I had to hit a few salons when I first started um, that made me promises, but led me nowhere. But in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the fact, they did. They led me to understand where I don't want to be, what I don't want to be. So there is a lesson in everything. And then it led me to the other places that led me to the place that at 21, I opened up my own salon. That's awesome. And believe me, I sat from six in the morning till midnight waiting for one person to walk in one but it took that one i didn't wait till nine of five of nine and somebody walked in i say oh, i'm closing at nine they walked in five of nine come on in let's do it you know let's get it done um so patience time dedication and i understand we have a life you know when i was growing up it was different uh, i came from a different country i didn't have money so however i could but understand that things take time. It doesn't happen overnight. There are some people that have that gift, God bless you. But there's a lot of us who have to understand with patience, with time, with the right attitude, you're gonna get there. But if you're gonna keep chasing money and keep chasing different jobs, you're never gonna get there because you gotta start somewhere and you gotta build your career. You're not gonna start a job and then be the head, the CEO of the company unless you've learned every part of that industry. So you might start out mopping the floors. Next thing you know, you might be the CEO. Same thing in beauty salon. You might start out maybe assisting or you might start out as working behind a chair, but then you get to the point where you build yourself up and you can open your own salon or rent your own chair or 
let somebody else have the headaches, do your nine to five, go home and put your feet up and let the salon owner worry about all the problems, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's just a matter of patience. And, and these days we're finding that uh, it's, it, there's a lack of patience. I wanted it yesterday. Well, shoot, I wanted $5 million yesterday. Uh, Ed McMahon or, or Publisher where, uh, Warehouse has not sent me that check yet. So that means I still have to go out and I still have to work. And even as a, a, a successful school owner and salon owner and spa owner and stuff, I still go out and promote like as if I started day one. Mm. I don't say I'm an owner, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm this, I'm that. I'm a hairdresser. Will you cut my hair? I'll tell you what, I got a great team that will cut your hair. If I can't do it, which I only do for charity now, I don't work behind a chair, but I've got, oh, listen, we can all, and I used to even tell my clients too, it's funny, I used to sit there and say, hey, you know what, look around you, see all these stylists? If you don't like me, when I get done, I will never be offended if you want to try somebody else in here that you see that you think you may go with. And it's funny, when you try to get rid of somebody, they don't leave. <laughs> it's like a relationship, right? You know, you're like, get out. And they're like, no, I love you. Uh, but you know, the thing is, is let them know because they're going to go searching somewhere else. Keep them within the salon. Let them know that you're open to it and watch how you're your career will grow if you're on purpose, if you treat people well. Just don't talk about yourself. You don't have to do a PowerPoint on your family. Like I go into some salons and they got pictures of all their kids and here's my Aunt Joe and here's my... No, when a customer comes in, it's all about them. Talk about them and talk about their children, talk about their wedding, talk about their family, their experience, their day. Um, people like to talk about themselves. But show them that you care. Not only talk to them, but write some notes down. So next time they come in, you can follow up with some questions. And they're like, how did you remember I took that trip? Because <laughs> ah, I love you. You know, it's, it, and, and remember, guys, it takes time. But with like anything else, those people that you give a great experience to will finally tell their friends. Just like you do when you go to a great restaurant or see a great movie. You will talk about it. And they not only pay you for a service, but they give you a great tip. And next thing you know, their friends are coming in and their friends are coming in. As long as you treat them like 50 first dates, if you ever saw that movie, where he had to get her to fall in love with him every day because she forgot the day before. So every day he had to start all over again to get them to fall in love with him. So that's how you treat a client as well. You don't take it, them for granted, but slowly and surely, if you're on purpose, you will get there. And trust me, there'll be people who try to sabotage you along the way. Don't focus on them. Focus on the person who came to see you. Wow. I love that. That was I'm sorry, I can go on forever because I'm so passionate about it, you know. I like that was that was awesome. Which you know, one of the questions that came up in the chat box, you've written two books, A Slap on the Back of the Head and Unwrapping Your Gift. And one of the questions was what really inspired you to write your two books? Well, first and foremost is Wynn came up to me and says, you know, Julio, everybody has a story and you have a story. And this is when I, uh, I don't know if you know, I was in a coma for about a month. I passed away several times. It took me three years to recover. Uh, I couldn't use my right legs. I had perineal palsy. They told me I'll never use my leg again. I had to learn how to use my hands and everything in the midst of my career taking off. I was about to open my second salon. Let's talk about putting your career on hold for three years. Um, so he said, you need to share your story. So who I needed to share it for first and foremost was me. And by sharing it to myself like a diary, I decided to turn it into a book. Now I'm dyslexic. So to type that, <laughs> it wasn't going to happen because uh, it, it took me forever. Uh, so what I did is whipped out a tape recorder and I would tell my story to myself. See, even when I'm talking to you or talking to you, all the people out there, I'm talking to me too. I constantly remind myself. And that book was a reminder of myself that my past is not my failure. My past is my past and I have to accept it. And my, my present is the moment. And the future is the dreams because tomorrow's promised to no one. So right now I'm in the moment with 
dreams for the future, but I focus on where I am now and I'm with you. I'm nowhere else. So that is what keeps you on pur purpose. And, and my other thing of writing the books was I can share this with so many people that probably feel like I do. Some people were, were you know, they can go through what we went through. They, God bless you. They were, they were were born with, you know, happiness and a great, you know, opportunities. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a lot of people who grew up like me and uh, who made mistakes, who had addictions, who fell into comas, who had six heart surgeries, who told he was going to be a failure, who we were told we would never amount to anything. We'd be in jail. We'd be in this. And to let them know. And that's why I even joined the community sheriff's department was to, to help the youth in understanding it's not what your past was. It's what you will become now and who you want to be. And by sharing those books, even unwrapping your gift, is we're all born with God-given gifts, whoever your God may be. But you're born with those gifts. And until you tap into them and unwrap them, you're never going to know for sure. But they don't just come easy. When you unwrap them, it's not like, ah, my first bike, I know how to ride with no training wheels. No, it takes time to work that gift until you can ride it without training wheels. But we are all given the gifts. And the gift sometimes is one simple little thing that might be missing. And the first, you can start that book wherever you want in the book, but the first one is procrastination. You know, I put that first because that was me, number one procrastinator of the world. Uh, my father used to call me Mr. Tomorrow because when would the things get done? Tomorrow, you know? But I kept putting it off, which gave me more and more stress. Uh, but there are two pages, and they, they talk about even loving yourself. Uh, before you can love other people, you have to understand who you are and how precious you are and how priceless you are and how amazing you are. Once you understand that, not in a cocky way, in a confident way, you don't go telling people how great you are, but you got to know that you're great. you got to feel that you're great so you can stand taller, you can smile, you can treat people great. Um, lead by that example. But you got to tell yourself that and you got to believe that before you can treat anybody else that way. So that's why I wrote those books was mainly for yourself. And, and somebody said motivation is like bathing. Uh, you can't do it once a year. You got to do it daily, you know. Uh, so that's what inspired me to write the books is, is first it started out with me talking to me. And then me sharing you with you, me talking to me. Uh, and maybe that one of those things, one of those seeds that I planted in there might be the seed you needed to plant and sprout. Mm. Yeah. I love that. It's incredible. Uh, the next question, um, when did you know that you wanted to open a school? <laughs> from the day I came back from Europe. When, when I, at 21, I opened my own salon. Uh, and I made money that I never had. I never had money. I used to have to cut lawns, shovel driveways because my, my, my parents were three jobs, my mother in a sweatshop. So uh, I would get a paper route and, and turn 50 papers into 300 just because I needed money to buy sneakers or a pair of jeans or whatever. Um, you got to forgive me because my ADD just kicked in. Your question again was? When did you know that you wanted to open a school? Okay. So... Then I couldn't get to college because <laughs> of my ADHD and uh, my OCD and my dyslexia, which I didn't know at the time. So I was not a college bomb person. I, I went for wrestling after wrestling. I just, you know, first class freaked me out. I jumped shit. My mother made me go to beauty school. And when I realized that it wasn't in beauty schools, but right when I got out of beauty school, I realized I had a gift uh, I had to work on. Uh, and when I, started meeting the mentors and, 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 and I, like I said, I opened my own salon at 21, made a lot of money. Uh, so with that money came the addiction, you know, cocaine, cause it, it, you know, like alcohol, you think it empowers you, but it doesn't, it, it will ruin your life eventually. Uh, at, maybe at that moment it did something for you, but eventually it'll catch up with you. And I had all these friends and I had all this luxury and I lost everything. They repossessed my car, my salon, everything was gone. Uh, so when I went and sought mentors to get off my addiction, which I chose on my own, was to get away from those friends 
And I found these certain mentors and started being taught life that my father always taught me. But, you know, when your parents say it, never, it's in there. But, you know, you're like, oh, dad, why you don't understand. Uh, today I do, especially since he's passed away. That's all I can think about is his teachings. But when I met these mentors, I was like, God, I would love to share this with so many people. I need to teach. And that's when I became an educator for Paul Mitchell in the early 80s. And then I said, you know what? I want to open up a school so that I can give people like me the opportunity to understand they can and they will. And that's what prompted me to open the first school was not, it had nothing to do with money, just like the salon. It wasn't about the money. If you focus on the money, you will never get it. If you chase just money, it's temporarily, it's not permanent. But if you're on purpose, and you do the right thing and you give from the heart and you do everything from the heart and the soul and the core of your gut to help others, the money will be the applaud for the great job that you've done. People will be throwing it at you, but you have to be on purpose. But the reason I opened those schools is to make sure that people who were thrown to the ground like I was from many people, from bullies to teachers that told me I would not succeed, counselors that told me I might as well hang it up or just start you know, shutting the door of the jail now. Uh, to the mentors, I wanted other kids to know that you know, anything's possible for them, no matter what. Anybody's told them or where they've come from. And I did not come from a silver spoon and I did not come from the big, you know, beautiful luxury, uh, what do you call it, neighborhood, you know, I was discriminated when I came here to this country at that time, they did not like Italians, you know, uh, so, you know, uh, I, I was just sworn and, and, and I, and I prayed that if I was given this gift, I would give it away because you can't keep anything until you give it away. What a great message. And then how do people, before we get to the last question, how do people get in contact with you? How do they find you on your social media? Uh, if you email me on my social media, it's tough because I'm not used to that. But my, it, my Instagram is gvayo, which is G-V, E is an echo, G is in golf, L-I-O. Uh, so it's G-V-E-G-L-I-O, and that's my Instagram, and you can follow me on that, and you'll just see pictures of me and my dog and my family, motivational quotes. My Facebook, I have a fan page, and I have a personal page, uh, which at first I didn't know what that meant, so for all you millennials, uh, my personal page is filled up, and I guess they only allow you 5,000 friends, but I do have a public page on my Facebook, um, and I, uh, you know, I just post once again, just strictly motivational uh, information, family values, pictures. Uh, I never talk about politics. I never talk about religion. I don't get into those arguments. Uh, what, I, what I want to do is talk and have a good conversation. I know how I'm gonna vote. I know what I believe in. And I'm not gonna try to change anybody's mind because they have the right to their beliefs and so on and so forth. Um, so I just stick to what I think is important, if you looked at my uh, Facebook, I'll talk about COVID. And, and, and that was way back in March or February. I talk about why a mask was important. What they're talking about today, I talked about way back then because I didn't want to be a victim to the news press. Uh, what I wanted to be is part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, so I went online and, and joined the John Hopkins uh, Contact Tracing University. John Hopkins University became a contact tracer, not to contact trace people. I didn't do that. I don't do that. But to understand what the COVID really meant besides all these other diseases, because they're still out there, even though they have vaccines for them. Even COVID, when they have a vaccine, it will always be there because COVID is a flu. But those are the things I love and enjoy doing. And I, started, I just started a YouTube channel. So if you put Giulio Veglio, which is spelled with a G, G-I-U-L-I-O, uh, and, and my last name, uh, I just started that YouTube and eventually, uh, there's stuff on it already, but eventually I'm gonna go on and put even more uh, customer service related stuff, self-help stuff, uh, just two minutes, three minutes, sometimes I get carried away. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm Italian, I speak a lot. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the thing is, is I wanted to do that not because I have any interest in making money. I just want to share. 
So it costs you nothing. There's no advertisement. There's no buy this, buy that. Uh, you don't even have to buy my belief system. Uh, but there's no arguing either. So if you want an argument, you're going to text the wrong person. You're going to uh, message the wrong person. Because I'm not up for an argument. I'll have a discussion about how we can work together. But I'm not going to argue whether my opinion is right or wrong. It's my opinion. And I, you have to respect mine like I respect yours. Uh, when I have a Jehovah Witness knock on my door, and, I'm, and I was raised Catholic, but I've been to every church you can think of, from Protestant to uh, Baptist, uh, because I believe he is everywhere, my creator. Um, I don't want to argue about whether your religion is right. I'll invite you in for coffee, but I'll respect you. You respect me. Let me learn about your religion. You can learn about mine if you want to. Uh, other than that, uh, let's move forward. I'm not going to change you. You don't change me. But I'll listen to you. I might have a, a change of heart. I don't know. But I respect you enough to let you have your opinion. I love that. Well, thank you, Julio, for, for being with us. This hour flew by. We appreciate oh. <laughs> I talk too much, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was great. You you definitely dropped some amazing things here for us today. So thank you so much and thank you everybody for joining us and, and take care everybody. Thank you for having me.